a winter of woe and an unprecedented crisis. That's the forecast for the NHS in England this winter. The Times reports this morning that government ministers now think as few as six patients in ten will be treated within the current target of four hours by accident and emergency departments. Chucks is a community nurse who told us why he is planning to leave the health service. We feel we're not giving the right care we should be giving because we haven't got the adequate staff to do the job. The pay is another issue because people will consider a lot of things coming into the community. It's really, really difficult and challenging for us. And sometimes we just go home, feel depressed because we are not given the, the right care we should be given. Chucks was so demoralised and frankly distressed by the fact that he cannot provide the care he wants to and needs to. And as you heard there, it's so difficult to leave that behind at the end of any working day. Let's speak now to Matt Neal, who is a junior A&E doctor. Matt, good morning. Good morning, Callum. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for speaking to us. Um, it's so important to understand the situation as it is across the NHS. And let's focus mm. on A&E with you. Um, what is a typical day like for you at the moment, Matt? Um, busy. <laughs> I think that's how we summarise it. So obviously it's always been a, a busy job in A&E, um, but the, the, the pressures are growing and growing and growing. So I think, unfortunately, you know, the, the type of patients that we were seeing has changed, not just because it used to be more emergency based, as the name suggests. Now it's um, kind of an overlap to more um, community problems, which can't be seen timely by the by the GPs because they have their own pressures. Um, but I think that, that's only one part of the problem. The other half is, is sort of facing kind of safety issues really and you know it's always been a, a case for doctors in a and &E where um corridor medicine as it's called is, is a last ditch resort really you know um all the beds are full so we see people on the corridor but i think it's actually gone beyond that you know we're dealing with waiting room medicine now where you're getting paramedics who are putting patients in the waiting room because they've got no other choice really um and that adds its own sort of element of risk so it's definitely still a busy job but it's now fraught with more risk than it used to be mm. In terms of how you work, can you can you explain your shift patterns and the demands that are on your time that you spend there? Yeah, so I mean, again, this is a fairly long-standing issue really, that rotors and they have been um, incredibly challenging for trainees, and I think you know, that's part of the reason why the, the burnout issues are so are so high amongst trainees in emergency medicine. I think it's something like two thirds of trainees on the latest GMC survey um, say that they're burnt out. In terms of our kind of working schedule, it's well primarily kind of twilight shifts really. So um, the busiest time of day is kind of late afternoon, early evening, which is why it's reflected like that. Um, but ultimately, we're jumping between you know normal working days like a nine to five, but then doing twilights of say maybe two p.m. till you know uh, midnight or so. Mm. Um, you might be jumping into midnight um, to uh, eight a.m. sort of shifts. You know, it's, it's very diverse in terms of a rotor yeah. but um and you do you loads of these respite. is the other thing sorry right? go ahead no i was just going to say you do loads of these back to back and work cumulatively many many hours in a week oh incredible hours yes i mean our contract as trainee doctors uh, which doesn't apply to everyone but as a trainee um it's an average of 48 hours a week um so a full-time job is still more than a full-time job mm -hmm. most places um but bear in mind that is an average so you know, there are some weeks when you're working 70 hours a week right. um doing kind of 12 and a half hour shifts back to back sort of thing and how does that feel for you when you are dealing with patients in corridors or in waiting rooms and you've worked 70 hours already in a week it's just incredibly frustrating it feels like a groundhog day situation really you know you're coming in you battle throughout the day to try and bring the waiting times down, try and get rid of um, the number of patients that are in the department. Generally, you might, you might succeed a little bit by the evening, but by the next day you're coming in um, again for an early shift and it's all gone back to back to ground zero, really. Um, so that's the main frustration. Uh, it just feels like you're getting nowhere. And I think a, a lot of trainees have a lot of worry for winter where we think it's just going to be far worse like it normally is. But we're already kind of seeing the winter pressures from previous years in the middle of summer. Mm. In your piece that you um, that you write for the Times today, where you sort of describe your day, I think mm. what struck me, and it's perhaps stating the obvious, but I think the way that you describe it is so powerful, is first of all, the number of patients you deal with in a day and the range of issues that you deal with in a day as well, and how you frankly have to just bounce from one person in one case to the next to the next. Can you just tell mm. us a bit more about that and just how stark that can be. It can be, yes. I think I, I touched upon the, on the article, you know, 
some days you walk in and there's an emergency straight out of the back you know you, you walk into the resource area and you're dealing with someone who's basically on the edge of death but then the next patient might be very very fit and well and just maybe not necessarily needed to come into a and e uh, that's not so much the problem it's the diversity that we see in emergency medicine is part of the attraction really you know you, you enjoy the diversity and the and the variation the frustrations come from uh, just really having no um no end goal i suppose you know it feels like we're just going through this vicious spiral of, of case numbers getting higher and higher um and really it kind of prohibits us from giving the best patient care we can you know when, when we're dealing with such over overcrowded departments mm. does it upset you does it distress you absolutely yeah you know i have my own you know anecdotal stories i'm, I'm sure everyone does of uh, people who haven't received the best care in a and and unfortunately you know, just last week i had someone who who passed away uh, and i think that's probably down to the fact that they weren't put in the right place you know um and ultimately that, that, that sort of thing does leave a mark on you you can't forget that sort of thing and it's no one's individual fault but there's a systemic issue there uh, that leads to higher risk and, and unfortunately worse outcomes yeah. you know we know that for every 83 patients or so that there are extra in an apartment you get one extra death uh, that shouldn't have happened really that's what the studies have shown um, and that does leave a mark you know you do your best to, to, to save lives and to you know to help people that's what being a doctor is all about um, but when the system is kind of forcing you into I say un unsafe practices, I suppose. Um, that carries a risk for us personally, but obviously it carries an even bigger risk for patients. When you say in that case that you mentioned that the patient was in the wrong place, what, what do you mean by that? So, I mean, let's talk more, more generally, but you yeah, know, I yeah, mentioned sure. before about waiting room medicine. So, okay, you know, sometimes yeah. people get put into the waiting room where they shouldn't necessarily be there, but it's not because of, the, you know, the trust's fault or the hospital's mm -hmm. fault, it's because there's simply no space. Um, and that's a, that's a really common issue. You know, you imagine someone who's got a really strong history of previous heart attacks and things like that. They shouldn't necessarily be sat in a waiting room, um, but it does occasionally happen. Yeah. We spoke to Chucks. You heard Chucks there, a community nurse earlier, who said that he's actually just planning on leaving the health service. Has it has it got to that stage for you? It's, it's definitely getting there. I think, you know, I'm a little bit older than some of my colleagues, and I think, um, you know, have my other other situational things like having children and things makes it very difficult to leave unfortunately we have a monopoly employer um that does tend to lead to issues around pay it tends to lead to issues around um staffing but unfortunately it also means yeah, it's very difficult to leave unless you want to leave the country um which i'm not quite at that stage but i know a lot of my colleagues are we've already seen um a lot of people leaving for australia new zealand mm -hmm. uh, canada because you know they have similar healthcare systems with some differences um but ultimately less pressure on the system yeah. What is it that you that you need to change, Matt? Is it is it the, the the size of hospitals that you need more beds? Is it the number of staff that you need more staff? Perhaps it's a lot of things. But but what are the, what are the things that actually would make the difference here? I mean, short term, I'm sure space would be useful. Uh, beds would be useful. And the problem is that that's not a long term solution. You know, when we dig down to this, and I'm sure you've heard this elsewhere, is that the problem is social care. Okay, so um, when you imagine this typical journey through A and E. Uh, for someone who's admitted to hospital, you know, there needs to be a bed somewhere else in the hospital to put them. Uh, the problem is at the moment, those beds are very, very short on, on number. Um, the reason for that is that hospitals can't safely discharge patients into the community. Um, so for lack of residential, uh, residential placements, um, lack of staffing in those placements, uh, because people are leaving those jobs, you know, for, for better play jobs in retail and other places. Um, so without addressing that issue, improving the social care situation, making it easier for hospitals to clear beds and to make more space from A&E, um, the situation won't get better. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. It is stories like yours that help us to understand exactly what is going on. And we are so grateful for you taking the time. So thank you and all the best to you.